and Uzi is here, and the wolf is gonna be falling. Uzi gets himself another six kills the game. Mid lane under fire. RNG gonna walk it up the mid lane here to the Nexus turrets, and they're gonna have it. The celebratory channel just for good measure, but Hootie cannot possibly stop this onslaught. 38 and a half minutes. Game one is done. RNG need two more. This win means so much for RNG. And guys, the reason why I say that is not just the fact that they went up 1-0 against SKT. They actually went up 1-0 in both their best of fives last year. But it's the fact that RNG stuck to their convictions. What were they good at? Late game team fights, they went for the Twitch Jana. They did not care about giving up Galio, about giving up the early to mid game. Their read was, if it goes long, we will win. And their read was correct on the day, at least for game one. And the confidence that will bring RNG, it's indescribable. The question we pose to SKT coming into this match, would they be able to push RNG off of what they, we've seen from them this entire tournament? They tried. They tried and they failed. It does bring back memories of Chicago, though, yeah, where sure. RNG again opened up with a victory. I mean, we've seen these series almost all go the distance. These games have been close almost the whole time through the quarterfinals. There is still life in SKT, we know. RNG is in SKT, Ted. They're playing blank for the first time at the start of a best of five when Peanut was there. They're adjusting their style, not playing their own and trusting in themselves. They brought a lot new. A little bit of it worked, a lot of it didn't. How they go in the pick and ban for game two, I'm so excited to find Video out. Best of five, there's more to be played for sure. So now to get our analyst thoughts on that win, let's stand over the dash and our wonderful analysts. Thank you, Freak. RNG strike the first blow in our best of five today, and we're going to start where they left off. Talking about this champion slug. This tournament has yeah. been a lot about adaptation in that pick ban phase, and both of these teams came out today showing us something a little bit new. Yeah, after the amazing intro, that was one of the coolest drafts we've seen because we've seen a lot of adaptation throughout this season. But then even just the first phase of picks, the fact that RNG showed the Soraka to potentially scare away the Janna pick set the table for a very cool sequence of events. Yeah, and the fact that it was the opening up of the Sejuani, so they're they're kind of baiting again, they're calling the bluff, you know, take the Janna. It, we don't necessarily need it or want it because they do have the Soraka and they allowed it to get uh, it allowed them to get the Janna either way. And I mean, when you talk about the Janna, I think you then have to talk about the fact that this Blitzcrank, SKT obviously knows that they're giving over Janna. They were happy with that matchup. They know that RNG has this uh, propensity to go late. They want to try to play this scaling comp. And a lot of it really came down to, can you execute with the picks that you've taken? With Blitzcrank, you have to be proactive. You have to hit Hicks. You have to be able to lane bully. And they really were never able to get anything from it. Which is why I really want to focus in on kind of two picks that speak a lot to me, which is the Shin and the Gangplank, and both their relations to the Twitch pick. I agree with you wholeheartedly. If you have the Blitz pick, you need to execute down their bottom, and every single time SKT went down there to try to make something happen, the Shin was just the massive thorn in their side. And the beautiful thing is, was talking to Deficio in between the match, what Shin protects Twitch early by denying a lot of the ability to try to kill him to exploit his weak laning phase, Twitch then pays back to Shin in the late game. Pony could never split push, he could never overextend because it's so easy for Shin to want, or excuse me, for Twitch to wander over into Shin's lane and to threaten that. And I think this draft was also indicative of SKT not being happy with the status quo. They did not necessarily play that well with the standard champions as we've said SKT has looked weaker than they have at other world championships. So they made this giant switch into the fact that they were pushed to the Zach thanks to very clever Ivern and Nidalee bans. But then the next question is like, can they actually play this well? And the Blitzcrank in this game from Wolf was almost useless. I don't remember yeah. a single good hook that he landed. It was it was pretty much straight up a 4v5, but I do think we have to give credit as well to MLXG for playing around what uh, SKT had drafted because I think you know his first gank was, was fantastic and critical. In, well, in, in reference to MLXG's play in this game, let's go ahead and take a look at the first gank thrown to the top lane as well as the preceding fight brought to you by Acer Predator. And it, it's so important to actually do this because one of the reasons people pick GP into Shen is because you can safely farm in the early game. You can scale up and then you can take over the Shen, but they never gave them an opportunity to get there. And then the Shen is able to get down to the bot size. They're able to make these effective plays. 
Yeah, and a GP teleporting in here would not be nearly as threatening. Uh, Huni also was pretty low in that lane, so couldn't teleport in. It's absolutely the Shen that set the table for Uzi to get ahead. These kills were spoon-fed to Uzi. And it's also the fact that if that GP wasn't put behind, think of how devastating that champion would be on RNG's composition. A GP ult destroyed Uzi and the Baron pit. A random barrel could just completely blow Twitch and Malzahar away. Like, you look at SKT's composition, they had so many different pieces and options to backline dive to hit the Twitch to deny everything, they were just unable to execute on it because the Shin was used so effectively. And I also think we have to give credit over to this, this Malzahar pick because I think Malzahar is so strong in the Galio and if you're going to give the Galio up, you need to have answers planned for it. The Janna, fantastic disengage, can allow you to survive through some of this crowd control that he's putting mm -hmm. forth. And the Malzahar allows you to actually have the Galio as a viable target because you're putting out so much frontline damage. You're locking them down for your carries. So you're both peeling and putting out the DPS. And I think it's such a smart answer. So really, both teams uh, just played very intelligently in the draft. And this is interesting to me because at the top of the day, we kind of talked about a few key factors for both these teams. For SKT, mm -hmm. it was them indexing and investing in Huni in the top lane as a win condition, whereas on the flip side, they looked at Bang and Wolf as underperformers. So what's strange to me here is that they do hand over a blitz crank to Wolf and say, hey, we need you to get work done in the early game where you haven't been getting work done in the early game all tournament long. And the flag is still there. Bang and Wolf, Wolf in particular as a Zale, was saying it's still underperforming. That was a 4v5, that blitz crank was a worthless pick. To be fair though, they're giving him a pick that can make something happen yes. in the early mm -hmm. game, right? So you're almost trying to enable him. You're saying, hey, you guys have been failing in the early game. We give you something aggressive. We give you this gift to try to take over the game and he failed to do so. And to me, honestly, more than anything else, this game is simply on the, the fail failure to actually perform by Wolf because he was, he was worthless. He did nothing this whole game. Yeah, and I have a mixed bag of takeaways after this game. Like RNG looked great playing through topside the start and transitioning at bottom, and the Malzahar pick was a great adaptation. But Uzi also had some really bad positioning towards the end of that game and didn't look that happy about the win. So you're wondering how they're going to be able to transition this forward as we've seen RNG take the first game off of SKT a couple of times already. Obviously, this one does feel a little different because of the way SKT reached in draft phase and were not able to pull out a rabbit from the hat, but it is a really interesting series still. I love what you said to me while we were watching the game, that RNG has made a, a small adjustment to something that they were already executing yes. on very well throughout the tournament, whereas SKT made a large adjustment, which to some degree might point to the fact that they're uncomfortable, at least in their play, with what they've done so far. But my question yeah. to you is, now that you've seen them try something dramatically different, is that the way they should keep going? Or should they roll <laughs> it back and go back to Tom Kench's in the bot lane, Soraka's, <laughs> Janna's, let's, let's survive to the late game because we did see a couple team fights that showed that glimmer of SKT, you know, the undefeatable yeah. team. I mean, I don't think you can blame the draft when the execution was so obviously poor, right? And it's, it's one of those situations where you can sit there and say, oh, Blitzcrank was a terrible pick, but then at the same time, you cannot congratulate Ignar for his wonderful Blitzcrank pick, right? Like, my it intent, comes down to execution. My intent is not to blame, but to say that, okay, you couldn't execute on this yeah. comp, so should you now move away from it? I say yes. Okay. I think SKT, historically, takes a lot of shots in game one draft. I've seen them give away dream compositions in game one just to demoralize the enemy team. So this could have been one. We're going to pick Blitzcrack. We're going to hook Uzi seven times. And then he's never going to show the light of day in the series from here on out. Right. It didn't work. So I think until we see game two, it's hard to make any close to conclusions on this series. Frost, SKT to blue side. Give me your thoughts on game two. I'm going to push back a little bit and say that SKT, yes, they were trying to cover up the weaknesses in their bot lane, but they were still trying to play around the strengths in their top lane. They put Huni on a massive split pusher. It countered or could answer RNG's composition very well, but I think the main issue for me is, is that RNG are so good at playing around a split pushing top laner. Constantly Huni was getting ca uh, caught out. Constantly they had answers that were rotating around the waves, and so that's where my focus if RNG can continue to control the pressure valve that is Huni and what he allows for SKT, I think they win this series very cleanly. I mean, a look of concentration on Uzi's face yeah. there as he gets Definitely the Definitely looks like rope. he has some neck pain. I mean, that can happen for a number of different reasons, but trying to get some attention back. And we saw the beginnings of the famous neck pain from uh, Faker. Faker throughout keeps that his game. neck very stretched. Woo! That's All right, well, RNG have shown they're looking to make history. See if the reigning champs can strike back in game two after the break.
，开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开开
which found uh, evidence of gravitational waves indirectly through its effect on the cosmic microwave background radiation. You, some of you may have been here when we had a, a discussion of this sort right when that announcement was made, but before it became clear that that was actually the, probably not the right interpretation of the data. So that was sort of a premature announcement that actually got a lot of people irritated, not because the announcement was of something that turned out ultimately not to be the correct description, but people felt that they really jumped the gun. These, this team had really gone to a press conference as opposed to going through the more traditional channels. Did that influence your thinking at all? I mean, look, I, was, I know a lot about that. Experience. Yes. First of all, let me say something positive. Yes, please. Say something negative, which is very important. That team that was <laughs> that experiment had made a dramatic improvement in the technology of the detection of the polarization, which is the, how the electric field points in the cosmic background radiation. Yes. They had, prior experiments had been 20 times worse than any experiment that those guys did. Yes. So that was a dramatic improvement. And what they did, they didn't have enough channels in other words, they made an interpretation. Uh, they did, I think, an honest Channels job. meaning frequencies. <laughs> did, I'll yes. get to what yep. it is in a yep. second. But they didn't have enough channels at the South Pole where they did the experiment. What they saw is a particular pattern in the sky of the polarization vectors. And that's, I won't, we, people ask what that is, but there's a pattern that the particular gravitational waves would make in the plasma of the primeval plasma. And that would then cause these waves that come from the electromagnetic waves that come from the early Big Bang plasma to have a particular pattern to the polarization, swirly patterns. Yes. And they saw those swirly patterns. Yes. And the trouble is that there are other things in nature that make those, and that's what you were referring to. Of course. And they knew that. They knew that. That wasn't that they were surprised by it. They knew that dust would cause that, dust in our own galaxy, and also electrons in our own galaxy that are in magnetic fields. That was a synchrotron. So both ends of what they were looking at, but they didn't have enough detectors of different frequencies to see that. So they made a judgment based on maps that they had. I, I, I think they were honest. Yes. OK? And they made a judgment that, that the, the dust couldn't be as bad as to make what they saw. Sure. And their and, paper makes that And the that paper clear, makes yes. that very clear. Now, yeah. where, where, where did they make a mistake? They made at least one mistake. I almost forgive them for that mistake. I don't feel so bad as some others. Uh, it is, I mean, they a dramatic development that in their own technology to be able to do this. And what they did then is they, they assumed that the dust wasn't bad enough to do it, and they published it without going to peer review. Yeah. See, and the group was too small. That's the real problem. They all had agreed among each other. I had, one of my students was on that, mm. on that team, and they had discussed this a lot internally, and they all together decided to take this gamble. So what happened is that then they needed a bigger group to look at them. That's why peer review is a very good thing to do. Right. And that peer review exposed the fact that there was a, ch a good chance that maybe it was dust that they hadn't gotten. Right. And, and, that, and that's where it stands now. It's still not, they haven't attracted. Yep. You know, but no, it, what they saw they, is what they saw. They saw what the they saw. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, but back to your original yeah. question, yeah. Does, does that kind of thing worry us? Yes. Yes. I th think the answer is definitively less. Yes. We yeah. didn't want to come out with the wrong result. Nobody does. Yep. This particular thing breaks all the rules. You, if you work in a laboratory and you do something and you see something, then you do it better, you do all the checks. This comes by in a quarter of a second, it's gone. Right. So we only have what we have to look at. Uh, we know you talked about, before we came on stage, the CERN discovery of the Higgs. They spend a huge amount of money to have two experiments so one can check the other. Yep. It's a way physics does things and gets the right answer. We can't do that here, so this had to be extreme. And I've seen experiments that seem convincing on, based on one thing and they're wrong, so I was very, very pessimistic and worried and yep. so forth. Uh, this just was so powerful we had it. Following up on that, you know, I think a, an interesting question just to get out in the open here is, so Einstein, I mean, take us through the history. It was Einstein writes his paper predicting gravitational waves back 1916, 1918, interesting. As I described, he had a sort of complicated relationship with gravitational waves, might we say. But why can't we do this in the laboratory? Why is it that we're only looking for, you know, colliding black holes or neutron stars? Can't, why is it possible that we could have done this in a way that was closer to 
An experiment that we could replicate and do over and over again. Sure, so you're asking, could we build a source of gravitational waves in a laboratory? And the answer is emphatically no. And it's really embedded in something that we all learn pretty early in our careers, that gravity is a very weak force. And so what the ingredients that you need for making gravitational waves is has so much mass compactified that a, a laboratory source is not possible. You can imagine taking, uh, so the, the, an example that we love to use is take a, take a dumbbell, yep. but make it the most ridiculous dumbbell you ever could think of, which is it's a, it's a rod that's a meter long, and you put a one ton mass on each end, and then you spin it at a, at a, a thousand times per second, and then you go stand a, few, a couple of hundred meters away from it and ask how strong will the radiation be? And it is such a ridiculously small number, it's like 10 to the minus 42. It's so small that I'm almost like reluctant to say, right? And so, uh, so no, it's not possible, and that's why we have to go out into the universe and look for objects that have enormous amount of mass. The black holes we saw have 30 times the mass of our sun, and they're, you know, at the time that they're, they're getting close to colliding, they're 150 kilometers apart from each other. So it is, it's ridiculous. And traveling near the speed of light. And traveling well. at half the speed of light. Yeah. And those are the conditions that we need. So, you know, even our ridiculous dumbbell is far, far from what can be done. Yeah. All right, so given that, we now know that we've got to look out into the cosmos and look at extreme astrophysical bodies, neutron stars, black holes. Now the question is, how do we get a handle on what we expect to see from Einstein's general theory of relativity? And, and Franz, that's where I want to move on to the numerical side of the story, which it's interesting. I, I have not read all press accounts by any means, but I haven't seen that side of the story given as much attention as it might deserve. As I think most That's everyone okay would agree. <laughs> yeah, and you agree with that, don't you? Uh, so I just want to spend a little bit of time on numerical relativity is what the name of the, the subject is. And first, we're going to begin again with a little clip that'll set up the conversation. And then I'd like you to help us take, take us through why computers and numerical methods are so essential. So we can run this next clip, if you will. So numerical relativity, the first part, the word numerical, is because we use computing techniques. So what happens is that um, the theory of gravity that Albert Einstein came up with with others about 100 years ago, last year, is extremely complicated equations, or set of equations. And they're very nonlinear. And that means that if you had one black hole, you could solve it analytically. But if I have two black holes, they don't add together. That's a linear theory. So to solve for two, I have to solve the full Einstein equations with all of its nonlinearities. And that takes computational techniques. And in fact, it took us until 2005 to solve it. And this was Franz Pretorius from Princeton. We have to use uh, uh, numerical relativity simulations, uh, which basically simulate the Einstein equations on a computer. And we build what we call templates that are used in the model search in LIGO. The model search that found the event used uh, on the order of 200,000 templates. Also, we use waveform models not only to detect uh, the signal, but also to infer uh, the parameters, the properties, because all the information about the source are imprinted in the waveform. It's like a fingerprint in the waveform. So you're, you're mentioned in there as the guy, right, who made this all possible. So why do we need numerical methods? Why do we need computers? Um, well, perhaps I can just really take a step uh, back and just say a little bit about you know, the kind of observatory that LIGO is. Yes. Right? It's not like a telescope where you, know, you focus, you look at a certain area of the sky, you focus, you, look, you form an image, and you see what's going on. It's in some sense a one-dimensional seismometer in some sense. We're listening to a sound. Um, and so you, know, you get a gravitational wave. You know it's a gravitational wave, but it's a series of wiggles. What does that mean? It's not giving you an image of the source. So we need solutions to the Einstein equations for various possible sources, black hole collisions, that tell us what those wiggles look like and so we can identify what's going on. Um, so that, that's, that's one thing. We need solutions to the field equations. And the field equations, by the way, are, have just magically appeared behind right. you. So. And look, look how simple they are. Well, that's actually part of the question that I wanted to right. explore. I mean, it, it looks 
simple, <laughs> but we physicists have this way of hiding complexity behind the symbols. I was, yes. and, and for this part, actually, I just want to take us through, because sometimes in these programs, you know, it is meant for the, the general person who just has an interest, but we'd like to sometimes do a little bit of the math. And, and if you don't like math, you can shut this part off. But let's just do a little tag team here. So this is the form of the Einstein equations. And if you're doing it a little bit more precisely, it has a few more symbols in it if you're not using the natural units that allow us to set certain terms to one. But even that, if we go a little bit further, is hiding this. So this is actually a, a, a more complete way of expressing the equations if we're now going to unpack the meaning of that first symbol, g mu nu. But then you look at that and you say, well, wait, what do all those individual symbols mean? This is called the scalar curvature. And that thing G is called the metric. And there's this little combination of them that gives you the scalar curvature. But wait, what does that really mean? Well, that's hiding <laughs> this complexity right here because we have this way of hiding the summation symbols within what we call the Einstein convention, using indices that contract in a particular way. So that's what that symbol means. And if you go a little bit further and ask yourself, what is the first term, r mu nu? That's the Ricci tensor. And it's given by this combination of stuff. But what's that new guy on the right-hand side? That's the Riemann curvature tensor. What is that equal to? Well, that's equal to this combination, <laughs> where those gammas are known as the Christoffel symbols. And then you take those, and what are they equal to? Well, they're equal to a particular combination of the metric contract with various derivatives of it. <sighs> <laughs> it's all just to tell you that this is kind of complicated. And the goal of the Einstein field equations, what all of this in some sense is about, is understanding that guy called G, which is the metric tensor. And just tell us quickly what that is, and I'll have a little visual that'll take us through that as well. Right, so, so Einstein's theory is a theory about space and time, and space-time is a geometric structure. And the metric tensor, in some sense, at every point in space-time, it's a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. So actually, you have not seen this before, but you were following exactly what I hoped you say. Okay. So, so you said the Pythagorean theorem, so why don't we just put that app here for the heck of it right now. So you got two points there, and take us through what you're seeing right here. Right, so you, you want to know the distance between two points. So now in general relativity, it's not the distance between two points in space, it's the distance between two what we call events in space and time. And so the, what the metric does, so with Pythagoras' theorem, we know it's delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared. Slow down, I'm root. trying to click. I'm trying to click and <laughs> okay. stay up with you. Here we are. Right. There it is. All right. So, so that, that little formula there encodes the geometry of Euclidean space. Now, you can also write it in terms of a metric, and it's a relatively simple, straightforward metric. Um, and what people in already you know, long before Einstein's time, when they started looking at general geometries of curved surfaces, um, they would say, well, how do we describe, if we now have a surface that's got a complicated curvature, we want to generalize what Pythagoras did. This metric is the a convenient mathematical way of doing it. And here's so, one just example, just so people who are following the math can go along. Here's a curved shape, if you will, and the distance between the two points is no longer just delta x squared plus delta y squared square root, which is what we learned in junior high school, but rather is given by some unusually looking strange combination of delta x squared and delta y squared. And if you curve it a little bit differently, we learn that the distance between those two points might be given by this particular combination of delta x squared and delta y squared. And finally, just to get to what you're describing in the general case, we can have combinations that aren't even just delta x squared, delta y squared. We can have cross terms, like on the far right, delta x, delta y. And finally, to get to that object called g, the metric tensor, this is sort of a generalized version of the Pythagorean theorem where you're going to allow the surface to be curved. And that G thing there encodes the geometry that Franz is referring to.
morning with a gun into my head. Somebody help me, she wants me dead. Woke up this morning with a devil in my bed. In the air, everywhere in my veins and in my head. She won't be dead, 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 She won't be dead, 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 dead. This morning, with a gun to my head, brother should have told me she will be dead. Without a warning, not a clue, without a sound. Turn your house out of bounds, you can run, but you can hide.
Whatever your idea, HostGator can help bring it to life online. Name of the game for SKT. They've given up game one against Royal before. They've always come back to win it. So now is the real test. You say, okay, can they replicate success RNG? Or does the old SKT come back to the same domination we have seen year over year over year? Picks and bands begin. Jarvan, Callista off the table. Here, there is a cloy deposit. I've got to find it. But it shouldn't be hard. It should be kind of like a divot in the ground. Alright, let's see. This way. There it is. Ah, the divot. Alright. Let's go ahead and start gathering some clay. Meanwhile, keeping attention around. The server is live, so that's why I've got to watch out. I'm overburdened. How much clay do I have? Okay. Wait, how much do I need? Was that a forge or a kiln? I think it was a kiln. No, it was a forge. Let's see. No. So just look up clay and I'll find out. But it is probably the best single bottom lane in League of Legends. And the duo is available. That's the surprise here. We see so many teams prize taking Zaya or Rakan first pick just to the Furnace. But it's not really open. I need 100 clay and I have enough. Yeah, I can't take that. I'm overburdened as fuck. Alright, let's walk back then. Zaya every single game, regardless of size. Previously to this, this time around it gets through, but he still goes for the late game team fighting. 
This is going to take a very long time, so I hope you guys don't mind. Keep myself going, keep an eye on my stamina and my food. Actually, my food should probably be handled here. It's a straight shot home, so as long as I don't turn like that. And he swallows. I burped like a god. I don't see this gate. See, what are you guys picking? Still a straight shot. And start walking a bit. And again, we do expect SKT to play Keep running. My environment. Check. At this tournament, he is well above average of the four percentage on every single individual champion that he's played. Whether it's uh, we're gonna be going past tank, this area. Is this where we set up base last? No. Last time I think we set up base somewhere so over here. No, not there. Maybe over here, or a little up north more. Maybe right here. Set up like a base somewhere along there. This is a perfect one. It's inland, quite far. It's got fresh water. Oh no, that's a swamp. Damn it. I should move to water there, but it's still within a good distance to actual water. Yeah. And now it's just a run this way. Ooh. Bang with the Camille. Trust your champion pool. Let's keep going for it. Leona versus. <laughs> Alright, the next level is will he also go fervor with the keystone mastery and full fervor of battle in Ignar? Or will he go with uh, you know some more shielding and blah 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 blah? Yeah. yeah. But regardless, versus a Rakan switch lane, that is definitely a punishable lane. They can attack this bottom side. The stats don't lie. A hundred percent win rate at once. Again, SK Heat himself. Oh, no! Turn! Nocturne gets picked up as the jungle pick here. I think it's also 100% win rate, by the way, brought out by the Gigabyte Marines. Let's bring back the heroes of group stages. There is the Gigabyte Marines here with the Nocturne pick. Could I guess has this race I can I constantly have. Not, but then also I guess I can do that. I can fall, constantly and have, uh, Leona, and we'll see how they uh, no like, play. Overdone stamina. Hello. He will want to go high damage and assassinate the virus in particular. You guys heard that one. Anyone out there? I don't want to check my player. Players. Right now, uh, I might as well. Okay, it's just me. So yeah, this is a public server I want. Just in case, but I'm hearing shit. That's gotta be some kind of animal. Realize this is a swamp instead, but there's a bit of fresh water right there. <laughs> so if we can build like a little walkway out there, but no, we'll probably just have to head out to the. Oh no, that's all salt water though. That's probably gonna be fresh water. That would be a perfect spot right there actually to set up. Fuck it. I'll set it up here. We'll set up a second base there. We'll just walk for the resources. SKT back against the wall, but they have done it so many times before. RNG in front of the home crowd, hoping to finally destroy 
the dynasty of SKT. Honestly, that sounds like those people. Is the first thing that my eyes are glued upon here. Remember how game one, when Hooney was on a split push, at that time it was gangplank, developed, was an early gank from MLXG. We don't respect the same sort of early gank, maybe level two, but not the same standard pathing for the nocturne. So it could be pressure relief, both from a Camille and a Leona. Um, a little bit of pressure right here. Who are you gonna get the hook shot of the wall? Nicely done. Does not have to burn a flash. You talked about early expectations. MLXG has 20 lethality right now into this game. This is gonna have to be, a, you know, warrior enchant, dust fleet of Drakthar, full assassin. Come on, on. we knew he was gonna be going full damage. He wants to one shot the the Varus in team fights, and let's take that as a grounded expectation, but consider that earlier, Camille and Leona can get a lot of work done, when Nocturne, he's just farm. Or, he can also one-shot a Camille, a lethality Nocturne also poses incredible threat to Huni on this champion, and we talk about the forward percentage, and the play style that, that it does involve for him, he made a very good escape here level one, we'll continue to track if he's able to keep that up. SKT can breathe in the early game, compared to, say, RNG, that have to respect all the pathing options available for a Gragas. So the yeah. fact that Hooney and Wolf can look for pressure for you early have to levels, pull it. can look for earlier plays because of the Nocturne, is something we also have to take into account. Ooh, they got them all. All five went to blank, got to level two red buff, leashed already by the duel lane. It feels good for Gragas to get that super strong start here. Even if it is on vision, MLG will uh, be able to infer the rest of the path as he can see. Hmm. Leave. We have to, again, check in on the strategy because RNG continue to give over this Galio to SKT willingly with these multiple counters prepared. I think you touched on it in Champ Select a little bit as well. As, you know, Nocturne with the, the counter to global aspect. We have to see All if right. able to get it. Okay, what definitely considered a skill matchup between the Camille and Nar. It tends to the advantage of Nar, as with most ranged versus melee matchup, but you're so favored ganking for a Camille compared to ganking for a Nar in terms of reliability. And speaking of ganking for a Camille, they're happy ah. to use the pressure Huni has generated to take a walk topside. Ooh, and he knows that Nocturne's nearby. I don't know if the Nocturne actually saw Faker himself, so looking for a taunt dive, MLXG nearby, but not any mana. Here comes all three. Looking for the play as TP comes in as well. Hot side to the right-hand side. TP can't, so gets a slow and decent damage on the Huni. Yeah, as soon as Ledby's able to get that level two off of that creep wave dying to the turret. Okay, let's go the to high. the water, I guess. Escape right there. Now, cooldown from Just that way. Teleport, uh, is an interesting trade as he was still able to jump his minion wave. Faker's gonna have to walk all the way down. Because I have to get water from somewhere. Yeah, something we've seen surprisingly often wasn't often in LCK. Admittedly, Huni wasn't playing that many games. But those visits topside by Faker, his ability to push out with Galio and leave lane, got them that big first blood against Misfits. Nope. He's trying to recreate that, but Nocturne on front got them the early. With all that focus on the action on the top side, we need to revisit again SK Telecom's bottom lane. All eyes were on them for how they'll perform. He stepped it up basically. Wolf has doubled down on this aggressive bottom lane playstyle, and with the double fervor bottom lane, Bang Water. and Wolf have been able to keep pressure at the turret. This allows them to be able to Okay, let's, yeah, let's go to the water. I do wonder if it would have been double fervor if it was a higher jungle proximity jungler than Nocturne. If it was an early ganky jungler, because this is certainly the highest amount of damage that can be output. So when you see Nocturne, when you feel like your offensive trades won't be answered by a counter gank in the laning phase, a 3 6 is probably Leona's weakest point in the game. <laughs> Going double fervor here is relatively safer than basically any other scenario you would have prepped for with the Nocturne jump. I think Bane's gonna run this almost all the time, but you're right, Wolf is gonna be much quicker with the Keystone choice, but happy to look for those 2 on 2 fights. Now, competitive League of Legends, even more so uh, than solo queue or anything like that, revolves so heavily around specific timing, and as we approach the 9 minute mark, is where we will start to see the level 6s come in for the bottom lane and for the jungler. So, we have a few more minutes of low, and see, we'll have to keep track of how well MLG is able to power farm, because Blake wants to play. Adjust that timer. He wants to get there before the level 60 starts to come in. Yeah, Ming's at 400 HP right now. Uzi is stealth looking at just the last hit and walking backwards, but the way it looks like actually might push toward the SKT duo. Looks like only got some boards and left right away. He actually did put a lane board down behind that. He's expecting the MLX to be roam. Very early ocean drake taken here by SKT. Probably just be duo down over time. Allows the Nox to be farming up to level 4 already. Good damage. Seeing how they're going to position this minion wave as well. SKT wanted 
out in the open. They're trying to move <coughs> you away from those dying minions. Meanwhile, Blank is going to be able to secure that Ocean Drake in the early regeneration. Will help out those guys. This fight just came back up. He actually checked for the damage rolling up. Nice stun out of Huniga straight right there. But the shield times out. I think it's a bit more damage across. It's going to be hyper triggered. And yeah, you can see this is a not easy matchup. So even without Nocturne, intervening anywhere on the map previously. Ceteris power, but other things being equal for RNG. Regent Sleeper's Tongs. Nice. That's a two summoner spell advantage now for the SK Telecom bottom lane. The flash from Leona can definitely be deadly in setting that up as well. Uzi does stick around and they have a little bit of defensive vision. Also trying to keep track here of the experience on Nocturne. He will need another two camps at least before he's able to lend any sort of assistance. That's when the texture of the lane's changed. That's how you get water, okay. Respect. Level 6 coming through from Nocturne. Uzi didn't mention it earlier. Did go cleanse in this lane. So doesn't have the barrier for another all-in. But he's been under his current. So for now, it's pretty predictable. And he is being able to farm up decently. Even if Bang has a nice CS event. We talked about time. Still have to worry about Baker on this gallery. So we track his play for the entire first six minutes of this game. He's constantly been pushing his wave and getting the ropes up on Galio. Oh, we have another exchange in the bottom lane. It's gonna be okay. They're going to make a bit easier to get away. You guys actually three dash to get backwards. Meanwhile, Faker continuing with the same game plan. He worked with Blank now for his invade on the Nocturne, getting some vision on the second spawn of the red. Remember, he was able to go get that ward. And the timing on the first red kill. They would have also seen the ammo XG just as we spoke. Pick up red buff, hit level six in vision. Important information for SKT. D lines down to the bot for the map right now. A flash was there without an ultimate. Could be the target. A Galio ultimate could answer for Faker. He would definitely need to roam down earlier. He's Faker, has the fear available to do some damage. Red buff on the There we go. A bit of damage early on. He doesn't have any armor just yet. Fear lands. Here comes Blank. Jahoo actually cut away by this one. Knocks down the void for the re-engage, but good luck for this one, the damage, they have it, first blood, in the two-on-two -two for SKT. That flash from Wolf is able to secure it, redeeming himself a bit here on the Leona, finds the first blood, four bang on there. And it's been so many games since we saw SKT actually being pushed up. We talked about Hooney's forward percentage, someone has to back away when one person's overextended, you can't usually have three lanes pushed up. It's largely been bang and Wolf, around 14% forward percentage compared to other lanes up to 40 to 50 percent mark this is a new side for SKT started with the Barris lock-in nice confirm on the kill okay. and it is important to do that SK Telecom bottom lane gets that kill before they're even level six this is one of the bottom lanes that has the most crowd control possible yeah so Bang and Wolf want to still pressure the opening where the classes are down for Boozy and Bang now that they have the huge crowd control advantage yeah exactly just got harder the open on every single member of SKT, you expect Blank to come up there at some point as well and continue to punish with this Twitch for Con plane. We'll wait and see if we can find that next moment. Again, we know MLXG has his ultimate up, but we'll see when that Nocturne first shows. Building a red spike and warrior, definitely a hyper aggressive build out of the RNG zone. The same way you can kill an enemy AD carry during his tether range, during his fear disease. So, some of that high damage burst build, but makes him more accountable. Also means he has less wards to be able to put down. Oh, he lane. hit confirm zone, he hit confirm stun, it's all the damage, but he just barely slings away. Ming survives, Blank nearby, though, and Uzi left a little 1v3. There's blood in the water, and all the sharks are coming, though. Blake is seen on a ward, and the collapse from RNG is going to not be enough to save a turret. He's still trying to Uzi knows where his teammates are. Ming has been injured, but still wants to be part of this fight. The turret will take damage, though. Bang lands a post and take turret aggro. And like Ooh. not yet fall, they're backing away enough. I think, called off. I think that SK Telecom can just stay here though and continue this pressure. Baker's gonna clear that mid wave, and but clearing that mid wave basically gives homework to Shaohu that he has to go attend to before collapsing and lending his presence to the bottom side. Lemmy was in Meganar in vision of Tony. They also waited out the Meganar. The Nar is exhausted, so now pushing up like you say, safer. Blank knows that MXG's in the area, but he's not concerned at all. They're going to the play the book. Nice fight of the middle space, but it still will be the fear. Here comes the re-engage. Won't you ride a flash to get this one? Do they have the damage? No, not just yet. Blank stays alive to get the kill. Let's trade back though for Uzi. 
one for one, jugglers both dead, Ming is around, here comes Chris to fight as Hootie has teleported in, the old way across, Xiaohu blocking the hexagon, you have the damage up, but not on either side, just the one for one. More important for SKT to pressure everyone out and speak the turret, this is a multi-pronged plan, the kills are great, the focus is on the turret, but the minion wave has been pushed out, so still more time for RNG. Exactly, RNG hold on to the top lane teleport for Let Me, and he, on Dar, is going to try and get some work done on this top side, that's why Huni immediately goes for the recall to try and reestablish after the reset here. Get to see the replay. Blank had walked up, and this is the first time we hear the ult pop to that ear curling scream. The interrupt on the body slam means it couldn't get out, and they do take down one. He ends up getting the kill anyway after yeah. receiving the knockback there, and it is the one for one, but play a little bit of a funny interaction as he pops his ultimate. Yeah, already burned some of the way out. So, Tibble walked away cleanly enough. Blue buff's gonna be going over to Faker. Not quite enough damage. He's gonna wait for the next Q cooldown now. Blank doing his duty as a jungler should. Wait the entire time. All the damage came out. Critically, though, you know, as we're talking about them, the resetting after that hit phase, I think he didn't push through the first crit bonus. So, this other side is a very valuable kind of goal for both teams to work around. Because of the extra teleports that are available on RNG, it makes it very difficult for SK Telecom to overextend, and they should not get baited in by this kind of low-hanging fruit. And Fang's in kind of an interesting spot. He hasn't recalled in a long while because he's working towards the Rage play. He also had the very early Ocean Drake, so he stayed in lane the entire time, built up a 20 CS lead. They could just leave the low health turret as the spot for a Galio ult, for a turret dive, but an extended laning phase to Rage Blade is decent for the side attack. It looks like RNG are going to make the first call. They abandoned that bottom lane turret, the first blood, the first turret going to go over, and instead they're going to try and make a play onto Huni with the roam up top. They're going to make the two and a half thousand gold lead. Nice aim out of Huni, getting the max distance possible on that twice now on very important escapes. And look at this, ocean break number two. Lots of early neutral objective pickups for SKC. And I think we have to compliment Huni's top laner sense because we've talked about the Pixies playing Jace, Jane playing Trundle. The fact that this team and largely has been losing in the mid game and has been forced to do it without vision. You need very reliable top laner sense to not just die again and again, just feed over kills, to actually be able to create map pressure. And the way I look at Hooney is he's kind of basically forcing a bad paradigm for the enemies. Either you gank him, and SPT is great at cementing vision on the other side, using the information that the enemy team is topside and getting advantage or steadying the ship, or you leave him and he takes turrets. That is the reality of the champion boys selecting. Games like the previous one, he gets ganked, the enemy team can't punish because Blitzcrank's not on point. That's an unfortunate thing for SKT, but this is more the norm, like we're seeing in this game. Right now it's that 2,000 change goals in the year, so SKT looking to bounce back to be nice. They look at still almost the same style as before. Again, a split pushing, you know, sort of carry type, you know, 131 top lane of the same Galio and another aggro lane to the bot lane, maybe a bit safer of a lane you could potentially argue, but Leona, again, only played one game at Worlds, SKT now three in a row saying, we don't care about Arden Sensor, that's not the style we need anymore. We're gonna learn from what Misfits did to us, and so far this game's looking good. Small point, but because they don't have Arden Sensor on SKT side, the one item power spike of the Rage Blade on Varus, I think is not as much there. Correct. Two items, certainly, it is very powerful, but usually if Varus gets the very fast Rage Blade, it's paired with an Arden Sensor, it's insane. For here, it's just a good start. Exactly, the synergy between those two items is actually twofold. Our, uh, you know, the reason that the Rage Blade users are so popular during this Art and Sensor meta is because you have more attack speed from the Art and Sensor to stack up your Rage Blade, which people sometimes forget is where the power yep. really comes from after it adds attack stacks. And then the Rage Blade is obviously going to pop double on hit damage from your Art and Sensor as well. Meanwhile, though, the turret gets taken down all the same. I mean, you get six stacks on it, you got a lot of attack speed, you do get this turret damage down, and for now, Uzi and Ming they have to respect the Galio coming through, so they're giving up three turret HP. And only real punishment on the map is the Meganar wailing away on the outer top bot lane. Okay, we look at scaling differences, it's the same choice as the last game, but this time, of course, it's much less gold than before. But Varus, typically not that same late game threat that Persona could be. You wonder what the 40 minute situation would look like if it got there. As well, it brings up this question of, you know, this, the factor of, of Nocturne skill. Because Generally accepted, especially so if you know, doesn't scale that well for late game team fighting. But if you bring into consideration what you're talking about using the ultimate strategically, you know, for cutting off options for SK Telecom, you know, Galia ultimates, and uh, team coordination, then if that. You get Baron control, you pop the Nocturne out, maybe you cement it as seeing this counter rotation by RNG bot side, double TP. Yeah, just Hoodie, a single. Yeah, Hoodie already never figured. Oh. Look at the flash forward. This guy's gonna land to the hand of damage. 
What picked up already the re-engager Baker's only a knock if he's still one versus three. The chase forward, Ming wants everything. MLXG rather, and no, it's gonna be him traded down to the turret. Baker pulling him into the damage out, but Uzi winning the wings though. The silence is on. Will they re-engage this one? Look for the play as he puts him into the turret. The damage up and coming across towards Baker, then back towards the jungle is Blank. Losing the health bar, but staying alive. The deadly venom not gonna be quite enough damage. All said and done, looks like a one for one. One for one, and Uzi and, well, Wolf actually is pushing for recalls here as he's able to stop a couple of them and delay the defense. Bang, meanwhile, pushing up mid lane to try and get some turret damage. They're still getting that free time. They got the top lane target, the two tower stuff, soon to be three. We see the replay here as Faker teleports down with the wave clear. Flash Nar comes through from Let Me. They do get down the first kill, but from there, they're not able to get more as Faker by so much time, and LNXG starts tanking. Yeah, Galio there, he's able to keep him in turret range for long enough, the last shot finding its mark there. Again, SK Telecom using this goal advantage. Let's see how they can pressure. They're using it in a couple of good ways. There's triple ninja tappy in the crew already. You're seeing Bang has his Faker Blink the same, and those are the primary targets. Oftentimes, I assume we're gonna see Huni pick one up as well in the near future. Those are the major targets. And the gameplay we're seeing from SKT is what they were trying to do in game one. It's the same style and pace of game they wanted to set. The tempo of the game, if you will, because when you have globals and you also have a dueling advantage, you have a jungling pressure advantage early, especially, you're all about having bank in the mid lane pushing a turret, or you're trading evil and down so you're getting a global lead in terms of objectives. They were all with their hands in the field job multiple times early game in game one. That couldn't happen, RNG were able to scale. This time they break. The average Canadian visits about seven different websites before booking a hotel. I totally get that. We want to make sure that we get a great hotel for the best price. But why only seven when there are so many more out there? Next time, before you book, check on Trivago. Trivago compares live prices for more than 150 different websites to make sure that you find the best price for your ideal hotel. Hit these ass. All right, furnace. Small hotel. Trivago. We're all over in the ingots, bars, and lumps. This particular place. A lot of construction skills.